If I just left this glass of water sitting out for a day or two, you can probably make a pretty robust prediction about what's going to happen. The water is going to evaporate spontaneously. This means that the liquid phase is turning into a gas phase. There's water vapor above the surface of the liquid generated through evaporation. When I close off this container, that evaporation doesn't magically stop because it's happening at the surface. But what does start to happen is condensation of that water vapor back down onto the liquid water surface. And we know that, of course, if the container were closed, the water would generally not evaporate. What we would observe inside the closed container, though, is a pressure due to the water vapor above the surface of the liquid. This is what's known as vapor pressure, and it's a very important property of liquids related to the liquid to gas phase transition. We could say it's a property of liquids or a property of gases on some level. It's a property of the liquid gas equilibrium associated with any substance. Most important for substances that we maybe want to work with in the liquid phase. We got to keep in mind that there's some vapor of that liquid above the surface that we need to account for. This is important, for example, if you're dealing with a liquid that is flammable because molecules in the gas phase that are also flammable above that surface of the liquid may be invisible but may still be ignitable. So this video is all about vapor pressure. When a liquid is inside a closed container, condensation and vaporization or evaporation are always occurring. So this equilibrium between liquid water and gaseous water inside say a closed thermos of water is always occurring and the forward direction is vaporization or evaporation and the reverse direction is condensation. Now at some point vaporization and condensation will achieve equal rates. This is a principle of physical and chemical equilibria. If that doesn't make sense yet just take my word for it. We eventually reach a point of dynamic equilibrium where the rates of the forward and reverse processes are equal, so we don't observe any net mass transfer from the liquid to the gas phase or vice versa. At that point, there is a gas phase. There are some number of gas molecules present above the liquid. Those gas molecules exert a pressure. This pressure is called vapor pressure or PVAP for short. The figure here shows how vapor pressure comes about when we start with a liquid inside a container and allow it to achieve equilibrium. So say we threw the liquid into this closed container, sealed it off, and looked for a pressure. Initially, there's no pressure because there is no gas phase, but evaporation occurs spontaneously. We know that because if I leave the liquid out in the open, it will evaporate away. And so some molecules enter the gas phase. Eventually, a point of dynamic equilibrium is achieved where evaporation and condensation have achieved equal rates. And there's a pressure observed, say in this attached manometer, due to those gas molecules, and this is vapor pressure. Let's take a look now at a molecular model of a liquid to appreciate what vapor pressure looks like. So here's a sample of liquid neon. We can see we're at the liquid gas phase boundary on the phase diagram around this temperature or so. And there's a definite liquid phase at the bottom, but notice the gaseous molecules are entering and leaving that liquid phase all the time. So gas is being generated and gas is condensing back down onto the liquid. The pressure due to these molecules in the gas phase above the liquid is vapor pressure. And those condensation and evaporation processes are happening right here on the liquid phase boundary. In this problem, we're asked to connect molecular structure to the extent of vapor pressure, or the size of vapor pressure. And to begin understanding this, let's think about this molecular model of vapor pressure and appreciate the connection to intermolecular forces. So vapor pressure is caused by these molecules in the gas phase. Those molecules come from evaporation, and evaporation requires the destruction of intermolecular forces that are present in the condensed liquid phase, but that are missing essentially from the gas phase, right? If we assume an ideal gas here. So we have to destroy intermolecular forces in order to generate the molecules in the vapor phase and generate vapor pressure. And this means that stronger intermolecular forces will be associated with lower vapor pressures or weaker intermolecular forces will be associated with greater vapor pressures. Another way to think about this, which is equivalent, is that condensation creates intermolecular forces. So the stronger the intermolecular forces are, the more stabilizing those forces are, the lower the vapor pressure will be because more molecules will condense from the gas phase to the liquid phase. So here we've got four molecules 
ethanol, ethylene glycol, diethyl ether, and water. They're going to differ in their strengths of intermolecular forces. So what we need to do is assess the dominant intermolecular force in each substance, assess the relative strengths of those forces, and then use the argument we just made to connect those relative strengths of intermolecular forces to vapor pressure. So let's do that. We're given Lewis structures for the four molecules, and the first thing to notice about ethanol and ethylene glycol is that they contain OH groups, which are classic hydrogen bonding groups. So both of these can hydrogen bond. Now, which has the stronger intermolecular forces? Well, I would give the nod to ethylene glycol for two reasons. Number one, it's a bigger molecule, so it has stronger London forces. Number two, it's got two hydrogen bonding groups as opposed to one. Diethyl ether, lacks hydrogen bonding groups, but does have a dipole. And this Lewis structure kind of obscures that. This is a bent molecule at the central oxygen. So it does have a permanent dipole and exhibits dipole-dipole forces. It also has London forces, of course. And then there's water, which can hydrogen bond, but is a relatively small molecule with relatively weak London forces, relative to something like ethylene glycol, for instance. So now we connect these relative strengths of intermolecular forces with the vapor pressures. The smallest vapor pressure will be associated with the strongest intermolecular forces, and that's going to be ethylene glycol, right, with the two OH groups, hydrogen bonding and the relatively strong London forces. Next comes water, due to its extensive hydrogen bonding network, which is going to stabilize that liquid phase, bring molecules out of the gas phase. Then comes ethanol, which still has the ability to hydrogen bond, but only has one OH group, which makes the hydrogen bonding a little bit weaker. And then the greatest vapor pressure will be associated with the molecule with the weakest, or the compound, with the weakest intermolecular forces, which is going to be diethyl ether. So this problem teaches an important lesson, how to connect the strengths of intermolecular forces with vapor pressure. Stronger intermolecular forces in the condensed liquid phase are going to be associated with a smaller vapor pressure, and weaker intermolecular forces in that liquid phase are going to be associated with a greater vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is temperature dependent. This is easy to see, for example, in this simulation. As I heat the liquid, more molecules enter the gas phase, and the molecules are moving more quickly. They're moving at a higher temperature, and so we would expect the pressure to rise just based on the temperature increase, even without considering additional evaporation. But it is an important point that these increases are non-linear. They're not just due to the molecules in the vapor phase moving faster. That's part of the effect, but it's also due to an increased number of molecules in the vapor phase. There's actually a net mass transfer from the liquid to the gas phase as temperature increases. And this is evidenced by the non-linear shapes of these curves. If the ideal gas in the vapor phase were just simply moving faster without any new molecules entering that vapor phase, these lines would be linear, right? They would just follow the ideal gas law. But the upward curve indicates that molecules are actually moving from the liquid to the gas phase. There is an equation that can be used to model these curves in mathematical form that we'll see in a couple of slides. Now, as the vapor pressure rises with temperature, there must come a temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure, which normally is one atmosphere, right, if we're talking about a liquid in an open container. The boiling point is the temperature at any external pressure at which the vapor pressure is equal to that external pressure, or the pressure imposed on the liquid by the surroundings, as the slide says. The normal boiling point is the boiling point when that external pressure is one atmosphere. So in mathematical form, PVAP at TB is equal to PX, the external pressure. Another useful quantity when it comes to this liquid to gas phase transition is the enthalpy of vaporization. There's some input of heat that is required to facilitate the phase transition from the liquid to the gas phase, and it's called enthalpy of vaporization. This is a heat input for reasons we'll come to in a second. But for now, let's just emphasize that this is a heat with units like joules, kilojoules, something like that. Generally, kilojoules per mole, per one mole of substance, from liquid to gas under standard conditions. And the little circle here indicates standard conditions. Now, vaporization, evaporation, is endothermic. Why? Well, we've touched on this already. 
the evaporation process causes molecules to go from the liquid to the gas phase. From a condensed phase where there are intermolecular forces going on, you can see those at the bottom here, to a gas phase where the molecules are basically acting independent of one another. And if I continue to heat this and kick molecules into the gas phase, we can see that more or less they are not interacting with each other or the intermolecular forces are much, much weaker. A heat input, an input of energy, is required to break or destroy those intermolecular forces. This is why in evaporation is endothermic. And for the same reason, increasing IMF strength is associated with greater enthalpy of vaporization. Water has a very, very high enthalpy of vaporization, which if you're a cook, you have a very intuitive feel for. A washed pot never boils. That is because the, vape, the heat of vaporization or enthalpy of vaporization of water is quite high. So just as we did with vapor pressure, we can connect IMF strength to the extent or size of enthalpy of vaporization.